I am pleased to introduce Dr. Patricia, Patricia Bowling. Dr. Bowling is an associate professor of political science at Purdue University. She's written books on public-private distinctions and comparative work-family support policies. Her most recent research project compares food cultures and anti-obesity policies in the U.S. and France. Today, she will present a talk titled On Feeding the Ten Billion. Please silence your electronic devices, but please don't put them away. We'd like you to follow along with Twitter and tweet with Dawn or Doom. Thank you. I give you the corn. It's a little warm up. Thank you all for coming. Today is a gorgeous day outside. You could be out enjoying the beautiful bucolic uh, cornfields and uh, scenery of Indiana, but you chose to be here listening to me talk about feeding the 10 billion. And I want to start by, by just putting on the table something a lot of you who know me are in no doubt about. And that's my tree hugger credentials. Um, I am nervous about industrial agriculture. And I'm going to talk about some of that nervousness today. I'm somebody who does my best to purchase my vegetables this time of year anyway at the farmer's market and through my CSA. I uh, worry about sustainability. I ride my bike to school. And, and that politics does inform where I'm coming from on this. But I also have very deeply rooted ambivalence about feeding the 10 billion because God knows, I want our country to be productive and generous. I want us to be producing the kinds of foods that can help feed the poor of the world and to have the will to do that. And I certainly see flourishing agricultural um, abundance in the world around me here. But I also, there's a part of me that, that's going to be the sort of the, the gloomy, doomy side of this talk, feel very anxious about the kinds of crops that we grow in this state and our reliance on industrial agriculture and what that means for sustainability and for the actual foods that we are able to export and give to people across the globe. So let me start with the, the talk proper. I plan to go for about half the time talking and have half the time for us to have a conversation. So please do expect that there will be uh, a lot of engagement for you to be able to say, I don't know what you're talking about, or to challenge, or to, uh, you know, to say things that maybe you think I should have said more about, or you don't know what I meant, or whatever. Okay. So this talk has its genesis in a conversation I had with a farmer about a year ago at a Purdue football game. And uh, this guy was saying to me, you know, it's amazing just how productive Indiana is. Farmers are incredibly good at what they do. Uh, we create such abundance. But boy, he says in an aside, we're really going to have to crank it up in order to feed the 10 billion that will be populating the earth by the middle of this century. And I didn't say anything to him at that time. You know, it was one of those conversational exchanges where you think about all your best lines the next morning. And, and I, I, it just niggled at me. And, and I thought about it, and I worried about it, and I thought, there's something that's just not quite right about this idea that Indiana should crank it up in order to better feed the 10 billion who will be populating the Earth. So, so that's kind of what I'm doing with you. This is one of these rare opportunities I have to, you know, to really kind of opine and present some gloomy and some hopeful ideas about agriculture and the, the world agri-food system. And, and in a way, this is all thanks to the, the guy I was talking to a year ago. So first of all, I do want to talk about the hopeful part. You know, here I have an image of what the cornfields look like in the Midwest. And I ride bikes. I, I do a lot of road biking. And I see what those fields look like from early spring through late fall. And it truly is beautiful. And right now, you've got to be kind of careful, because if you're out in the wrong roads, there's these tiny little hard corn cobs, because they're, they're harvesting. Harvest is a little early this year, because we've had a dry summer, right into the summer. And you know, I can't help but be aware that there is a lot of productivity, a lot of good things going on with respect to, to creating foodstuffs. And, and I want to just talk about this in a kind of hopeful way for a minute. Indiana produces a lot of food. Now, this is the next two slides. This one and the next 
show where we rank in the top 10 in certain agricultural commodities. And so you can see, of course, we're number five in corn and number four in soybeans. You can't help but miss that. Uh, but we also are producing a lot of smaller crops that I never would have guessed we would be in the top 10 producers nationwide. Uh, so for example, we grow spearmint and peppermint and tomatoes for canning and cucumbers for pickling and snap beans and blueberries and cantaloupes and watermelons. Those, those I did know about, they're so good this time of year. And we also produce, we're in the top two or three in fact, for producing chickens eggs, ice cream, the chicks that become laying hens. We're also sixth in the nation for turkey production, eighth in the nation for pork, and we're one of the top producers of, of um, popcorn. Now, having said that, and I, I have to say, th this, this list surprised me a little bit. I, I think, in fact, the reality is that really what we're producing a lot of is corn and soybeans. And uh, in terms of dollar amount of the value of different crops, we, we are by far and away producing corn and soybeans. So I want to talk a little bit about, uh, a, I'm going to look at a couple of little trade journals with you. And the first of them is Indiana Agriculture Grow With Us. This is put out by the Indiana State Department of Agriculture. You can see here's a new dawn over the cornfields. And a lot of important people in Indiana government. I think this is kind of an interesting one to look at. Corn and soybean leaders. Corn is grown here. Much of the corn in Indiana is used to feed pigs, cows, and chickens. We produce a wide variety of corn, more than 20% of the U.S. popcorn supply. We also produce a lot of soybeans. Soybeans and related products account for $2.9 billion in agricultural exports from Indiana. That's a lot. It's pretty, pretty impressive, actually. And accounts for 17,700 direct jobs for people who are connected to growing soybeans. So there's just no way to put this other than to say, if you're employed by the state of Indiana, you would be foolish not to admire and appreciate the fact that we have a very vibrant agricultural sec sector because their productivity is partly responsible for our productivity. And the, the good employment rates and the prosperity of Hoosiers is partly, partly due to the fact that we really do have a very impressive agricultural sector. So let's talk for a second about exports. This is in millions of dollars. And the export looks a little bit different than just how much we produce. What you can see is that we're exporting a lot of soybean-related items. Uh, about a quarter of Indiana's agricultural exports have to do with animal feed coming from soy and from corn. Another 20% or so are composed of uh, animals. So basically, we've got a little bit of exports of, sorry, beef and pork, not so much beef, pork, eggs, chicken. Um, so all in all, you can see that we're heavily skewed towards soybeans and corn. Um, just in terms of what we do with soybeans, this is just a little diagram that shows you how soybeans are processed. So by and large, mostly they start by being crushed. The oil is separated from the dry part of the soybean. Soybean meal is then used to produce feed for animals. And uh, that feed goes to feed different kinds of animals to a different extent. So for every kilogram, every thousand grams of animal, for chickens, 575 grams is coming from soybeans and somewhat less for eggs, somewhat less than that for pork, and rather less for beef. So all right, um, one more look at a trade magazine. This one is from um, 
the National Corn Growers Association. I wish there was a nice way to show this to you because I really want you to see what starts here and attaches to the next page. But uh, the caption is, and you'll see this as I, as I go forward, many hats, one purpose, to feed a hungry world. And so the corn growers are certainly playing on this whole idea that we need to be able to feed the 10 billion, we need to feed the hungry world. And, and there's a lot of interesting language and rhetoric being used in this trade journal. Uh, America's grain is fueling the planet. When it comes to value, corn delivers. One kernel, many uses. And there are others. There's a lot of talk here about um, sustainability, being able to use no-till approaches to agriculture. Um, it takes many hats to grow our economy. And in some ways, this is my favorite image. The steely-eyed farmer wearing a flannel shirt and overalls and gazing at the horizon. Now, to be sure, a lot of this is public relations. But there is some truth to the idea that the Indiana state economy and the US agricultural economy is a source of prosperity, jobs, and cheap food prices, and that all those things are related to farm operations and especially production of row crops like corn and soybeans. Now that's about where the sort of upbeat part, the, you know, the first part of that ambivalence that says, I'm really impressed and I really would like to hope that we can do a lot to, to really help uh, the expanding poor population of, of the world. That's about where it ends. And now what I want to do is to spend the rest of my talk talking about doom. And, and there's basically two big arguments that I'm going to make. And my idea is I'll set these out and then we'll talk. And, and you may very well have some disagreements and things that you want to say some more about. But the sober doom related part of my talk today takes up two big issues. And those two big issues are, first of all, the kinds of foods that we're eating and exporting to feed people in poor parts of the world. Are we doing people a favor by producing more corn and more soybeans or not? And the second argument has to do with the loss of ecological resilience in the world's agri-food system at a moment when most scientists are convinced that we are on the cusp, we are seeing the beginnings of real climate change. And that with climate change, we're going to see less predictable weather cycles, more you know, uh, summers like this summer, where we have a ton of rain and then we have none, or violent uh, weather events like hurricanes that can wipe out entire crops. And, and so just at this moment where we are pretty sure we're facing troubled times with respect to growing agriculture, do we have the resilience that is necessary to be able to adapt to those kinds of, of crises and unforeseen problems. OK, um, as we've seen, most of the agricultural products in Indiana are not eaten in their raw form by human beings, but are fed to animals or processed into other forms. Corn is used for three main purposes, ethanol for feed and it's uh, used in wet mills and dry mills to extract high fructose corn syrup and other starches and sugars that are used to manufacture things like uh, soft drinks. The portion that's used for ethanol has risen dramatically over the last 10 or 12 years. And you can see this yellow part is the part that's ethanol. And um, of course, what that's used for is basically to fuel our cars and make us less dependent on foreign oil. Soybeans, as we saw earlier, are mostly used to extract their oil for human consumption. And then the soybean meal is used and processed to make animal feed for chickens and pigs and cattle. And uh, when we look again at that slide for, India's, for India's, Indiana's agricultural exports, we see that soybeans soybean products and um, animal feed 
are really responsible for 75% of what we're exporting, and then another 20% or so are animal products, uh, live animals, poultry, chicken, chickens, pork, eggs. So a whole lot of what we export to the rest of the world food-wise is either animal, animal products themselves, or um, goods that are made to feed animals, or to create soft drinks or sh sweetened drinks with high fructose corn syrup. One of the things I want to say about this has to do with who we're selling our high fructose corn syrup to. This is not an Indiana slide, it's a US slide. But look at it. 82% of the high fructose corn syrup produced in the United States is sold to Mexico. 8% is sold to Canada. And then rather little amounts are sold to different countries in South America and Asia. Now, notice, of course, Canada and Mexico are NAFTA trading partners, North American Free Trade Association, right? But I also want you to know something that may not be just right on the tip of your tongues, and that is that the country with the highest obesity rate in the world is Mexico. And part of the reason for that is because people consume a lot of high fructose corn syrup sweetened agua frescas and, uh, and sweetened drinks. And it's a huge problem. And to the extent that we are contributing to helping poor Mexicans be fatter, this is not exactly a legacy that, I mean, this strikes me as something that is in the realm of, of gloom and doom and not something to be happy and proud of. On the topic of food exports and obesity, accounts of the world nutrition transition show that diets around the world are changing away from traditional diets that centered on coarse grains like sorghum and millet and vegetables and legumes toward, guess what, a Western diet. People are eating more refined carbohydrates, inexpensive oils and fats, fried foods, and consuming more sweetened drinks. This transition, of course, of course, occurred a long time ago in the US and in Europe. But now, poor countries in Africa and Asia are following suit. And as they do, what we're seeing are higher rates of overweight and obesity and higher rates of diseases like cardiovascular disease, stroke, cancer, and diabetes. We're also seeing, on the good side, that middle class people in countries like China and India are able to afford and want to eat more meat. And to the extent that they can, that's probably a good supplement to their diets. But their poorer counterparts having abandoned traditional diets, are choosing foods that give them the most calories for the amount of money they have to spend. And again, what that is, refined carbs, oils, fats, sugary drinks, and snack foods. People are getting fatter and less healthy from the south side of Chicago to the slums of Calcutta. And the cruel irony is that you can both be fat and food insecure and not be getting the right kinds of calories or be certain that you're getting enough calories to sustain ordinary daily activities from one day to the next. So my first misgiving about feeding the 10 billion really, really is this question. Why do we need to produce more corn and soybeans to feed the 10 billion if the very things that we produce are contributing to people eating less healthy foods, and consuming foods and drinks that are high in calories and low in nutrient value. That's a, that's a straightforward argument. The, the next argument I want to make is a little bit more tricky, and it has to do with ecological resilience. What I'm going to argue is that the loss of ecological resilience in the world's agri-food system at a moment when climate change threatens to make unstable and extreme weather events much more common and resilience and being able to deal with those kinds of unexpected upsets is especially important, that that loss of resilience is something that should, should really concern us. I draw here on several articles that were published this year in the Journal of Environmental Studies and Sciences that, that address this problem. So what's causing this lack of resilience in the agri-food system? I'm going to argue that two things are going on and then I'm going to try to put this together with the whole idea of feeding the 10 billion. At the risk of bodlerizing a subtle and important argument, let me be brief and simple. I think two big changes have occurred under the current 
agri-food system that is sometimes referred to as industrial agriculture. And those changes have to do with monocultures and reliance on chemical inputs, fertilizers and pesticides, and genetically modified seeds, rather than tending to the soil quality and the sustainable approaches to agriculture. And the other has to do with consolidation of ownership, management, and purchasing. So let's take those one at a time. First, monocultures. When I talk about monocultures, probably a lot of you know what I'm thinking. But maybe I will surprise you, because I think there are more dimensions to this than we sometimes think. First of all, I'm thinking monoculture in the sense that we're seeing large farms that plant a single crop. And, and one of the interesting statistics you can see I put on this slide is, look, in the period from 1958 to 1997, acreage almost doubled in Illinois that was devoted to either corn or soybeans, which means a whole lot of farms decided they were going to produce corn or soybeans, and that's all. And that kind of specialization, of course, has roots in policy decisions that encourage farmers to plant from fence post to fence post, and they did. And the evidence of this is all around us. Now, that didn't always used to be the case. It used to be there were family farms and all kinds of farms that had diverse kinds of crops. They might grow some corn, and they might use their corn to feed their pigs or their chickens. And they might grow some vegetables on the side. But we have specialized to the extent, and we go about doing agriculture in a different way now, that you've got to have a very special kind of combine. Maybe it's computer controlled. Maybe you're buying all of your seed from a particular supplier. And there are efficiencies of scale. And so it's much, much more likely that farms are just planting one kind of crop than used to be the case. I think about monoculture also in terms of the loss of genetic diversity. Now, the loss of genetic diversity is partly due to decisions about trying to farm vegetables on a very broad scale and to economize by planting vegetables that can be picked by machines. And so that means you've got to have whatever, tomatoes or whatever vegetable it is that you are picking by machine, has to all be about the same size, or it won't work. And for that matter, uh, you begin to choose seed varieties that are sturdy, that aren't going to be squished in the process of being picked. And so you end up with commercially determined species that have large markets <coughs> that, that we're choosing, not because they taste good or because people like them better, but because they're easy to pick by machine. And um, part, of, part of this lack of diversity also has to do with decisions in recent years for row crops to be, for farmers to really be feeling very intensely that they need to get the best yields they can. And the only way they're going to get really high yields is if they resort to buying genetically modified seeds that are Roundup Ready. And those seeds can be planted close together. They can be sprayed with Roundup, and the, the plants are not going to suffer. And all of the pests, all of the unwanted weeds will be eliminated. And um, that led to an enormous change in the early 2000s towards the diminution of different kinds of seed types. Just this morning, I heard a story on NPR about a, a seed bank. I think it's somewhere like Norway. And they were talking about how you know, all these different seeds have been put away in the seed bank for just in case. And I, I, I keep thinking, it's not just in case. We're doing this. You know? And one of the dangers is if you make it, make it so that farmers feel like they have to buy certain kinds of seed strains, all those heirloom approaches to doing corn, god, there must be, right? They're being lost. You just, you just don't have this capacity anymore. OK, another way of just thinking about this is um, industrial agriculture plants about roughly 150 different species. But peasant pre-industrial agriculture is planting more like 7,000. And so what's happening is a huge divergence in the way that we do agriculture. Monocultures also exist under the soil. And when farmers stop doing things like crop rotation, which they are not doing so much anymore, you who needs to do crop rotation, you must add some more fertilizer. You don't need to renew the soil. Just to put a little more phosphates on it. Stuff will grow just great. 
Well, what happens is that when you stop using crop rotation and cover crops to regenerate the fertility of the soil, the microbial characteristics of the soil suffer. And the use of commercial fertilizers hastens that. The solution under industrial agriculture, easy, just use more fertilizer and more pesticides and more herbicides. It only makes the long-term degradation of the soil happen faster and, more, uh, and be worse. And similarly, the use of Roundup Ready seeds has killed off the weeds. They used to just grow right next to those cornfields. And those weeds, it turns out, turn out to be a very important source of nutrition for honeybees. And because of honeybees, you, know, you have to have honeybees. If you don't have honeybees, you don't, you know, you don't get your plants um, to, to be fertilized. And, and without this easy form of nutrition that came from common weeds, honeybees are in trouble. And that, you know, that's very disturbing from the long-term point of view of the sustainability of agriculture. All right, so, so what? This is a question I always tell my students to ask. And I tell them, you've got to have an answer to the so what question. And my answer to the so what question is that all of these ways in which we have depended on monocultures is making it harder for us to know what kinds of things we need to do what kinds of resources we might, might prove to be essential for dealing with crises and climactic weather conditions that we cannot anticipate. And, and it seems to me that inattention to sustainable agriculture will serve us very badly if and when, as I think likely, scientific or industrial fixes don't work any longer. All right, the second argument. Um, how can we see the growing concentration rates of food and agricultural related industries and what difference does that make? So I want to show you two slides about this and, and try to speak to this. Let me explain at the very outset what four firm concentration ratios are. This is a, a pretty commonly used thing that social scientists who study agricultural concentration use to measure concentration. So, if we look at 1990 beef slaughtering operations, the four top firms, IRP, ConAgra, Excel, and Beef America, controlled 69% of beef slaughtering operations. That's what it means. And by 2011, they controlled a different set of four. They controlled 82%. Now, I put in turkey slaughter because Indiana has a pretty healthy turkey industry and wet corn milling and soybean, obviously. And what you can see across the board is substantial increase in concentration over the 20 years from 1990 to 2011. So what? So why, do, why should we care about uh, an increase in concentration in this industry? Isn't it, in fact, um, to put it quite bluntly, isn't it normal and natural and good that capitalism becomes more efficient in order to remain competitive. Is there really anything all that pernicious going on here? Well, I want to argue to you, yes, I think there is something that's scary going on here. For one thing, concentration has occurred at the level of individual farms and farmers as well. We have many fewer farms, and the holdings on the average of those farms are larger than they were 30 to 50 years ago. The farmers who are still farming are caught up in relationships with grain dealers or meat processors or seed companies because they have to sell their stuff to those people or they have to buy essential products from them. And they don't always have much choice or autonomy about farming according to what they may think are best practices or considerations of ecologically sustainable approaches to conserving the land or the water. Think about California right now or not overusing fertilizers or pesticides. And the smaller farmers, they've just been pushed out. You have to get big or get out. And to the extent that that's happened, it might be that smaller farmers are a particularly crucial resource because they're more nimble. They, don't, they haven't invested tens of thousands of dollars in combines. So all right, we're not going to plant corn next year. We're going to plant something else. And they can do that. Whereas the large farmers have made enormous investments that make it hard for them to change what they're planning to do. 
So to the extent that that's part of this concentration story as well, farmers are not particularly free to make choices about the best way to farm according to, to their own lights. The small farmers are getting forced out of business. Farmers are being told, well, you know, there's only one way to grow corn, and it involves buying the latest hybrid species and applying Roundup to kill weeds and fertilizing thoroughly. Then pretty quick, pretty soon, what you find out is all the other approaches die out. And forms of expertise and judgments about how best to preserve the land and the community do too. So misgiving number two. I'm sorry, I, I didn't show you this one. Let me just quickly say I think concentration occurs at many levels. And this is just looking at grocery store chains. And it's a pretty arresting slide. What's arresting here is 1997, that would be uh, a 14 year span between 97 and 2011. In 14 years, we went from five companies controlling 24% of grocery store chains to 2011, we have four companies controlling 51%. The wild card here is Walmart. So what's that mean? Big grocery companies want to purchase their vegetables and their foods from big companies that are predictable, and they're very happy to, to have interactions with ag industrial farmers. And, and it means, again, that you better be producing whatever it is you're trying to sell to please those big buyers and the autonomy of the individual farmer suffers. Leading me to misgiving number two. The organization of the agri-food system, get big or get out. Buy your inputs from and sell your crops to big corporations. Be efficient and specialize in one particular crop or raise one kind of animal. It's undercutting the adaptability and resilience we need as environmental and climate-related crises loom. If the impulse to produce more food for the 10 billion requires more monoculture, more reliance on chemical and genetically modified inputs, more concentration of ownership, then maybe it's not worth it. All right. That's my formal presentation. Now I want to hear what you all have to think. And I, I have questions. And you, you no doubt will have questions that I haven't thought of. But I did want to ask you, just right off the top, am I overdoing it? Am I painting this, this doom portrait in a way that is just not seeing, not it's not imagining enough to see how our agricultural and food system could adapt? Are there ways to feed the 10 billion good food and avoid the bind that we're moving toward of rigidity and lack of resilience? What would they look like? Yeah. Speak up nice and loud because he's, he's filming. Oh, yeah. <laughs> food that they needed, and it became the economic culture. Yes, so you could go regional rather than national big exactly. corporate. And, and if you did that, if I you really cultivated that. those networks, then you could be creating plenty of food to feed people that wouldn't necessarily have to meet that monoculture Okay, this is what this is what Walmart expects from us. Yes, or you know, his field, gosh, that got rained out of watermelons, but mine are fine, so you know, we can supply Or maybe, or, hey, you know, look, you know, together. my watermelon seed worked and that one didn't. Or, you know, the, the vine borers got that particular field full of cantaloupes, but they didn't get mine. So you just have more variability and more chance at experimentation. Is that what you're getting at? I I yes, I I'm interested in the topic um, very much and I think in some of the just the reading that I've done, um, there are some local farms that are trying to do those kinds of things, but it seems really difficult to take to scale when you're up against um, big agriculture. So, you know, I'm going to just show you all. I had lots of prompts, and and it might just jog you and make you think in different ways because I was thinking in similar ways to you, right? By putting up. Um, 
phrases and keywords like big, get bigger, get out, CSAs, farmer mar farmers markets, which I think resonate with what you're saying, suggesting that maybe we could do more at the local slash regional level to be productive in, in a different way than this kind of very uniform monoculture approach that we've seen so much of. Other, yeah. I think it's not just about agriculture, but it's also about valuing the cultures around the world. Um, you know, valuing. I've spent time in the Middle East, and it's and and they sort of show up. They they get very excited when they do things that are, that are very Western, and they want to show it to me. But I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in their and their culture and their traditions and and what agriculture is there. What I mean, what that world is. And so it's. I've heard the term cultural colonialism. And so I think it's not just about agriculture, but what I heard you talking about was we're exporting our diet. We're, they're valuing what the West has. Well, I value what mm -hmm. the world has. Mm -hmm. and so it's I think you can tell I do, too, that there is yeah. a way in which this sort of abandoning traditional diets does not strike me as wise at all. But I think that's part of, I mean, how, and I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to, like, I mean, I'm just one person, but how can we say what's in the West is not best? Yeah. Well, here we are. <laughs> We're yeah. having this conversation. And, and I think that's part of some of the solution to this. I, I see that as part of, as one piece of the solution to the global agriculture. Because if we're exporting our food, if we're exporting, well, let's stop. Let's, let's reintroduce, let's right. value that. OK, two responses. One is agricultural imperialism as well as cultural imperialism. And I think they're connected. Because I think we have an agricultural, you know, I'm talking about a and you know a single global agri-food system. Well, that's probably not right. There is a there is a hegemonic system, yes, and it's making incursions. And there is a lot of Western science which is suggesting that you do it our way if you want to be productive. But I think there are also many suggesting. I mean, a, a really interesting finding was that that in the West. Industrial agriculture uses 70% of the resources available to produce 30% of the world's food. Peasant cultures are using 30% of the world's resources to produce 70% of the world's food. The other thing you had to say, um, you just, what was the very last thing you were talking about? Because it was something connected to that. Uh, the, the West is not best. <laughs> well, the West is not best, but. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I lost. There was another little sliver of that that I thought was really interesting. But you know, I think I think you're right. And yet, I know what it was. How feasible is this? You know, there there are forces of world trade at work. There are profits being made. There are powerful, powerful groups that stand to gain. And I, you've, I've shown you lots of names. And and so what. What you're suggesting is have more respect for local approaches that are less productive, but maybe more in tune with drought or particular environmental circumstances that fit each of those particular places that are more connected to that region, those people, that culture, is, is very contrary to these large world economic forces. And so you know, in, in other work I've done, I've kind of made the argument, we've got to pay attention to what we can do. What kinds of change are possible? How, how can we change this? How can we halt this? And I don't know the answers to that. I suspect you're probably thinking, oh, don't ask me. Well, I mean, I was an activist before I came to Purdue. I was an activist before I did my PhD. And, and so it's not that I think I'm helpless, because I've seen right. change here in the United States. I've seen political action happen. Yeah. I mean, I've, uh, I've watched that as, as a peace activist. I've watched that. So it's yeah. not that I think I'm helpless. But sometimes when I, you know, Sometimes I do feel helpless. I'm looking at what's happening in Syria, and I feel absolutely helpless with what's happening in Syria. And I think about this issue, and I'm just one person, but it's, I think that from an activist perspective, you're talking about creating a movement. And if people care enough, I mean, we can. I mean, things have changed. We've changed the world. And, and if these global companies can change the world this way, well, if the people want to, we can change it back. And you know, maybe some of that change starts at home. As, as you were suggesting, maybe some of that is kind of supporting local agriculture and, and more sustainable approaches to, to, to producing food. Exactly. Mm -hmm.
So I think continued food scarcity is only going to lead to more and bigger problems of war and, you know, migrant um, situations and things like that. You know, people have to, are fighting over who has the food and viable land and, you know, where they're going to be able to feed themselves. Um, to be sure. It's going to continue to, to be, be sure. Big. And there are intractable problems, mm -hmm. whatever your locality yeah. is, and that's certainly a big one. Yeah. work um, at the Mays Institute way back in the what, all four 1940s and forward. So it turned out that over the years, and this seems even off by the way, but um, after all the, the, the money, time, and effort that we've put into um, learning how to grow corn, wheat, and other such things in the Western diet, we got really, really good at it over those 200, 300 years we've been working on it. And so, for instance, whenever India back in the 1960s was, was um, possibly confronting and, and with the population growth going on, a uh, famine coming up, mm -hmm. um, we introduced, through Borlaug and his work, dwarfed uh, wheat, corn, things like this, because we knew how to grow it very, very well. And it was a policy change on India's part to actually shift the country's diet in that direction. So it's not necessarily, I think, like an overall like um, sort of conspiracy on the top of these companies to do this. It's just, honestly, we got really good at it. And even the, talking about corn, for instance, look at all the, all the different climate regions that corn grows in. We grow it in the desert. We grow it in the Midwest. We grow it pretty much everywhere. We've gotten that good at it. And even corn now is even like a, a major crop in Africa and places. So that's part of the reason why, why we have a monoculture like that is because mm -hmm. it's something that we are just really good at growing. Mm -hmm. um, some other notes on this, too. I, I don't think, uh, too, like... Um, you had a slide that was talking about the, the distribution of, of corn uses, and one of the things you had on there was the uh, rise of fuel alcohol as um, a corn product. So the, the other part of this, and it's a big part, is, is that how subsidies, especially subsidies in the EU and the United States, play into all this. One of the reasons why California is going through a draw, and I actually used to work for the USDA on, on irrigation systems, is, is that the policy of water use and electrical use in, in farms is just this nightmare labyrinthine thing that's a split between the federal government all the way at the top and who owns what waterways all the way to the bottom about who owns geologic rights to water and everything else. It is a mess and it's very complicated. And there's this trade-off between electrical use to pump water versus water that's carried over canals, desalination. Um, it, it, it's a big deal. And one of the reasons why fuel alcohol is such a big part of this now is because we basically pay for it as a subsidy. Um, it by itself, I don't believe, is even profitable without those subsidies. So that's another part of that, too. Uh, those are great comments. I especially agree with what you said about um, subsidies and, and routines that the federal government has set up that, that make it profitable to grow corn for ethanol that otherwise, calorie for calorie, doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah, one other thing too, um, about agricultural, like, like um, industrial agriculture, you had another slide that was talking about, like for instance, how Illinois' um, acreage had changed. And I, I, growing up in southern Illinois, I know that we grow like a lot of apples, for instance, down there and whatnot. Um, but I would also be curious to see how, how land use in total has changed over the years, because there was a time um, before about 1940 or so, before the rise of industrial agriculture, when we actually had a lot more land under till than what we do today. And in fact, uh, most of the, the forests in the United States are second growth forests because they originally were cut down, axe, axe from horizon to horizon, so that you could grow enough crops at that level of, of yield per acre to feed the country. And now with rising yields per acre, and basically the trade-off is we're paying for it in petroleum, right? And to produce yes. these fertilizers and things yes. like that. Yes. But we are able to use a lot less land to produce the food that we need versus, again, like letting the forest, the forest grow back and whatnot. So there's that trade-off to, to add into it as well. You know, you've said three really interesting things. Let me just summarize them. The first was um, basically the Borlaug initiatives were pretty progressive and helpful. Look at India and look at other countries that have adopted uh, very efficient ways of growing crops that otherwise they wouldn't have been as productive as they are and they're feeding more people. There's tr that's true. And, and I'm not uh, suggesting that we should be absolute Luddites or that uh, initiatives like, um, you know, coming up with drought-resistant sorghum is a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. On the other hand, you also said that, um, well, look at corn. It grows everywhere. Well, yeah. And in some countries, people eat it as a staple. It's a staple in Mexico. 
Um, I believe people eat mealy pops in South Africa, which are basically kind of corn mush. But, um, but the corn that we're exporting from the United States is not being used for food for people. It's being used for fodder for animals. And, and again, to produce things like high fructose corn syrup. Could it be used in, in more um, ways that, that really would fill people's bellies and, and give them a healthy balance of, of, of nutrients? Yes, I think it could. So I don't want to be taken as saying that we you know, could absolutely never export uh, corn and, and have it be used as human food. In fact, it seems to me that if we were to just ship a little what we grow here, we have a climate in Indiana that grows soybeans like a champ. I bet we could grow other kinds of legumes. And, and wouldn't that be a great way for us to feed ourselves and the, and the poor people of the world? I don't, you know, I, I think imagination needs to be used here instead of being so overinvested in what we produce. And I, I certainly agree with what you said about subsidies and um, what was the very last thing? Oh, yeah. Of course we're much more productive. And that was one of the first things I said, too. So, yes. Pat? Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the, oh. uh, the Green Revolution. So, you know, one, of the, one of the reasons why we have to deal with this feeding the 10 billion is, is because of the Green Revolution. And that is because that, that was only possible because of the, the Haber process, uh, producing nitrogen fertilizers or ammonia. Uh, and so that's, in my opinion, unsustainable. One to two percent of the world's energy is used to produce these nitrogen fertilizers. And so here we are blasting along, producing more food, maybe more efficiently, up until some point where it's going to go the other way. <laughs> so maybe we're going to feed the 10 billion and we're going to kill the, the, uh, the, Gulf, the Gulf of Mexico with the fertilizers that wash off in there. And we'll have all sorts of other mm -hmm. unintended consequences. So at some point, it's going to have to go the other way. And, and I'm wondering if you have any opinions about how that would be accomplished. I think we're in the middle of a public discourse about this. Um, I feel like, as a member of the social sciences at Purdue University, that there's a, a lot of voices over in the College of Agriculture that pretty much agreed that Borlaug and Haber process and go, 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 the more fertilizers, the more g uh, genetically modified species, the better. The more, the more inputs, the more efficient you are, the better. But I think that's changing. I think even in the College of Ag, there are um, people who are saying, like Steve Hallett, makes the same argument you do. Eventually, we're going to run out of electricity, then what? And this little bit may not really last. There, there was another comment. If this is right on his tail, I'll go for it. But she, she had her hand up, too. Is that all right? Go, go ahead. Go ahead. You, had the, you got the microphone. OK. Um, one question you ask over there, do you know where your 10 billions come from? And that uh, is a question that could be addressed Do you as know well. where your food or the 10 billion's food? Yes. Uh, and my observation is that the population growth comes primarily from failed states. Mm -hmm. For example, take Yemen. The economy of Yemen is based on petroleum. Currently, the petroleum is exhausted. They have very little water. They have no precipitation. And they use water from groundwater, which existed from geological times, but is no longer being replenished. Therefore, they're losing the economy by losing the petroleum. They're losing the water. So this is completely unsustainable. And the net result of having these several failed states like that is war and mass migration. And I think we're witnessing both of these phenomena right now. And I wonder what social scientists have to say about this problem. He, he'll take it. I already have my own. It's attached to me. Um, honestly, I think you're raising a problem that goes well beyond my expertise. Because I do know something about what states in the world have the highest fertility rates. That is where population increase is happening. But I'm not an expert on failed states. And, and I could ask my colleagues in political science to speak to that, but I'm not going to put them on the spot to do that. I, in my mind, the humanitarian issue of feeding people who are hungry 
is distinct from whether they came about because they live in failed states or because they live in parts of the world where birth control is not practiced and it's common for women to have five kids. Really, the issue I'm concerned with is how do we feed people who, yes, the world's population is burgeoning. It's going to continue to increase. And, it, and it's going to increase in poor countries, not in wealthy countries. So, so I'm not going to try and go for the whole filled state argument. Um, obviously, migration is an enormous problem, as we're seeing, from Afghanistan and Syria and Africa to Europe. And it's especially obvious right now. And Europe is struggling mightily with what to do about opening their doors to refugees. Question over here. Um, I had a comment and then a question. I don't know if anyone heard Howard Buffett when he was here. I'm not an expert on global, but even though we might produce a large amount of a crop, sometimes the supply um, abilities to get that to the people that need it have other problems fraught with political and, and corruption and so forth. Um, the question I had is there's an argument that the quantity of food that we produce cheaply in plentiful amounts, at least in this country, makes drives price down for mm -hmm. certain things. So if you have people who don't have a lot of income to buy food, oftentimes you go to the store and the plentifully you know, produced food is cheaper for them to buy than the one-off um, sort of organic mm -hmm. beef and that sort of thing. And have you looked into that at all? I've thought a lot about it, actually. And, and one of the things that worries me is that when I think about this internationally, the cheap price of corn has put Mexican farmers out of their farms. And they've turned into farm workers in the United States who get paid very little. Uh, sure, uh, people, when they're faced with very tight budgets, will pick up cheap food and are happy when prices are low. And compared to the rest of the world, the US food prices, I don't know the rest of the world, with Europe, our food prices are quite reasonable. And if you're really look going looking to feed a family on a budget, I think it can be done. I think it can be done. And the thing that worries me is what, if, what, what you're finding, at least what one sees depicted in, in movies like Food, Inc., are uh, people who go to McDonald's and buy their families burgers and fries and soft drinks and say, yeah, well, you know, we don't have any time to cook, and this is cheap. That's not a solution. I mean, I also think it's kind of spurious, um, because if you really want to feed a, a family cheaply, it's a little time intensive. You buy lentils and rice, and you make a pot of something, right? That's the cheapest way to eat. Americans have done that for a very long time. They still could. But that gets into a whole different kind of issue about preparing food versus buying fast food and, and where our tastes come from and what we take to be delicious or what we think is convenient or pleasurable. And I think those things have, ch have changed a lot. In the effort of time, I'm going to take this gentleman and the gentleman in green okay. for the next comments. I, I just wanted to commend you for addressing these issues. I think these are very important issues that we face as a society. Uh, concerns about environment, concerns about feeding a growing population. Um, I guess I'd maybe circle back and connect to the comments of the young lady back in the back corner talked about culture and um, activism. I think it's important for us to remember that, you know, that cultural issue can cut both ways. We, we have a changing culture in this country. It's changing pretty rapidly with respect to food and importance of local food. Uh, one of the fastest growing uh, size classes of farms are the small farms. Mm -hmm. If you look at the latest agricultural census, small farms account for almost 90% of the farms in the U.S. Uh, they farm over 50% of the land. They produce about 25% of the food products in the U.S. So, so small farms are actually growing in this country. I think it's because we as a country are well off, we're wealthy. Um, and we have turned a lot of our attention and our income towards food that maybe was focused on some other things in the past. But, but I think the flip side of that is that we have to be careful that we don't take our current food culture and project it on the rest of the world too. Um, the population growth is in developing countries where income is tight. Some of it's in developing countries where incomes are growing. 
and it seems a little imperialistic for me to sit in the United States where I have the diet that I want um, that includes meat um, and lots of specialized mm -hmm. proteins mm -hmm. and say they can't have it because we're not going to produce it. Um, and I guess the, the last comment I'll say is I, I think I'm not a great supporter of biofuels policy, but I think biofuels and corn sweeteners have been a little bit misrepresented in the sense that they're not the only things that come out of that process. All right, so we take the energy out, we make fuel, we take the energy out, we make, we make sugar, but there is a sizable percentage of that that's remaining that's high quality protein. In fact, even more concentrated protein than it was when it went into those plants that can be used for human food or animal food and contribute to feeding uh, this 10 billion people that we project to have by 2050. So um, again, I really appreciate you bringing this because I think these are huge things that we have to struggle with as a, as a responsible population um, in today's environment. So Thanks for that comment. Um, Pat, I think, I don't know, I, I feel like you're kind of Pollyanna-ish. Wh 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 where's the 10 billion, wh what, what um, year is that figure? Oh, it's supposed to be by 2050. Okay, 2050? Mm -hmm. I, ha I don't think that the United States is going to own feeding the increase in population. I mean, um, if you just, like, think about what's happening in Europe and all these people streaming over the border. I mean, the thing is, are people in the United States going to just say, you know what, um, like people in sub-Saharan sub Africa don't have anything to eat, so we're not gonna be driving uh, <laughs> anymore, so you know, the, um, we can send the corn there, or, or, or people are gonna I think you misconstrued what I said. I'm no, 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 but, 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 but what's what what the population now, seven um, billion? 7.3 or so. Yeah. With the decline of productivity of the land because of um, uh, climate change, I, I I don't see a way out of, out of this really. Nor do I. You know, I I, I think uh, the ways that, the ways out would be challenging uh, certain forms of production that have led to monoculture and excessive you know monoculture under the soil as well as above, and they're not going to be easy to to produce, and I'm hardly Pollyannish about that. I mean, I, I think we've got formidable economic forces that are driving agriculture just the way we've done it, thank you. And the solution, just do it more so. And I don't think that's an adequate solution at all. Um, do I think the U.S. is gonna turn into a big benefactor? No, this guy had this conversation with me at a football game and said, oh, we're gonna have to be more productive so we can feed the 10 billion. Honestly, I, th I think that we want to sell our goods to the 10 billion. We want to be able to get Coca-Colas and, and burgers and junk food in front of a, a new audience. But I don't think we're really earnestly interested in trying to, to solve uh, world hunger to the extent that we're going to stop driving our cars so that we can produce more corn for hungry people. I'm not that Pollyanna-ish. That's really kind of what I'm saying today. So. Thank you all, again, for coming and for a very interesting discussion. Thank you, Dr. Bowling.